Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is Monday, January 25th, 2021. And rather than posting just the kind of occasional updates to my Facebook page about uh, the latest COVID data, what I want to start doing is maybe a weekly uh, video series in which I can actually show you uh, the data as I get, get it every Monday. And then we can just kind of go through some of the most significant findings from those data. Uh, so I am posting this video to my uh, YouTube channel where I typically post all of my physiology and my biotechnology lectures. Uh, so if you're watching this video there and you actually uh, are not coming from my Facebook page, I'll just introduce myself very quickly. Uh, my name is Gary O'Mealy and I am a biology professor at Tulsa Community College. Just to provide a little bit of a caveat here or a disclaimer, uh, my training and my background is actually not in virology or epidemiology. Uh, I'm a cell biologist by training, so just wanted to provide a disclaimer here that while I do feel pretty good about some of the conclusions that I'm going to make about the data, uh, I am certainly by no means an expert, so uh, you are certainly welcome to take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt, but I do feel pretty good about some of the conclusions that I'm going to make, but because of my lack of expertise on the subject, I may not be able to give you the sort of depth of analysis that you might be able to get somewhere else, but I certainly can recommend at the end of the video uh, some people that you might want to consider checking out uh, for that sort of thing. So let's go ahead and start looking at the national data. So uh, I get these data every day and every week from the COVID Tracking Project, which was a collaboration started by The Atlantic. So uh, it's definitely very worthwhile. They, put, they make the data available for free. Uh, there are people, uh, a number of people working tirelessly every day to both collect, uh, input the data, and then also organize the data so that uh, people like me can make videos on it. Uh, so definitely grateful to the people at the COVID Tracking Project. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the nationwide COVID-19 data for all uh, 50 uh, United States, uh, all the states of the Union, and then also uh, some outlying territories like Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and uh, Guam, and American Samoa. Uh, so looking at these data, you have to kind of keep in mind that this is uh, these are cumulative data, so the data are going to be kind of weighted heavily towards the more population-dense states like the Californias and the New Yorks and the Texases and places like that. Uh, so I will spend a couple of minutes going over specifically Oklahoma's data since uh, I, I live in Oklahoma and that's probably where most of my Facebook friends are going to be uh, concerned about. Uh, so if we start by looking at the national data, uh, this goes all the way back to the, I guess you would call the unofficial start of the pandemic, which is kind of the middle of March, uh, early uh, April of 2020. Uh, so you can see that if we look at daily testing, the number of new COVID-19 tests that are administered every day, uh, the trend is actually very strong and it really has not changed a whole lot in that we are doing more and more and more testing every single day for the most part. So that's definitely a positive. Regardless of where we are with the pandemic, we always want our testing capacity to be as absolutely high as it possibly can be. Uh, now, one thing that you might notice about kind of the irregularity of the data within the last few months is that you do see some kind of drop-offs in testing capacity, and then it picks back up, and then you see another drop-off, and then it picks back up. Uh, so the first two drop-offs that you can see there are fairly easily explained in that they coincide with uh, the Thanksgiving holiday and then the Christmas holiday. So there are things to consider there, uh, such as people uh, sequestering themselves over the holiday and maybe not feeling like they need to be tested as much. Uh, and that's kind of the thing with tests. Uh, you can't have your test numbers go up if people aren't going out to get tests. So that's why you see those going down. Uh, but something that is starting to become a little bit alarming at this point and uh, can't obviously be explained by a holiday is that testing is kind of starting to fall off just a little bit more. So that's a little bit concerning and definitely want to encourage everyone to continue to get tested. If you feel even a little bit sick or if you uh, suspect at all that you may have been in contact with someone who is COVID positive, definitely go out and get yourself tested even if you feel fine. We definitely need those testing numbers to continue to uh, get higher and higher and higher. Uh, so if we look at the daily case numbers, you can see the first two waves of the pandemic clearly visible here. 
Uh, now, these first two waves uh, don't look nearly as big as the wave that we're currently in now. Uh, one of the reasons for that could possibly be that testing capacity just wasn't where it needed to be at that point. So uh, if you're not able to test as many people as that need to be tested, then the uh, what that particular wave isn't necessarily going to look very big. Uh, but testing capacity has definitely gone up, and you can actually tell that we are in the midst of a fairly significant, fairly deadly wave right now. But if you look at the uh, trend line, which uh, tracks uh, a seven-day uh, moving average, you can definitely see that we have some positive news to report in that the trend is that cases are continuing to go down, and that's definitely a good trend. Uh, so we would definitely rather testing continuing to go up and then cases going down, but it is at this point a good sign that uh, the inflection point here says that the slope of cases, the rate of cases going down is more significant than the rate of testing going down. So we would like to see the testing kind of rebound there and cases continue to go down. Uh, so the hospitalization data, you can see that the first two, the first two waves are, were uh, practically identical in uh, their capacity to put uh, patients in the hospital. Now, this third wave that you see right here, this is definitely the sort of thing that cannot be explained by a prior lack of testing capability. So the current wave that we are in right now is definitely much more deadly and much more significant than the first two waves. So uh, definitely very uh, deadly in terms of the uh, hospitalization rates. But again, we are if, if we take any sort of positive out here and with the number of deaths that we're looking at here, it's very difficult to take any sort of positive or silver lining out of this. But it definitely is a positive that uh, the total number of people hospitalized in the United States is starting to go down. So that should hopefully start freeing up some ICU beds across the country. Uh, and hopefully if people who are sick with COVID need those beds, they can take them up. Or better yet, if uh, those beds go unused by people who, are, 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 who have COVID, those beds can hopefully go to people who have other sorts of serious illnesses in which they would require access to an intensive care unit. Uh, and deaths, if we look at uh, total deaths across the country, uh, this is lagging a little bit behind the hospitalization rates and then for obvious reasons lagging way behind the total case numbers because uh, it's going to be a little while after you test positive before you really start getting sick. So that definitely makes sense that hospitalization and death totals would lag behind a few, at least a week or so the daily case numbers. Uh, but the daily deaths is also starting to come down a bit. In fact, we had... Uh, uh, 1,940 deaths uh, yesterday on January 24th, and that was a significant improvement from some of the prior days in which we had eclipsed uh, uh, either almost 4,000 or well over 4,000 deaths in those particular days. So things are definitely trending in the right direction there. Uh, so if we take a couple of uh, conclusions here, uh, Breaking things down on a case-by-case -case basis, which is something that the COVID tracking project does, so you can kind of check that out if you're interested about particular states. Uh, so the number of cases is declining in 46 out of the 50 U.S. states, uh, three of which are kind of experiencing uh, kind of a steady state in which they're neither getting worse nor getting better. And then the only one state that actually is uh, actually experiencing a incline in the number of cases is Nebraska. And that's not to say that Nebraska is doing worse than other states. It probably just says that they're uh, time-wise, they're kind of running a little bit behind other states, maybe by a few weeks, just because uh, the population of Nebraska is a little bit more spread out. So they were maybe a little bit more resistant to the early parts of this current wave. And now they're just kind of starting to get caught up. So I would actually expect Nebraska to maybe start getting better here before too much longer. Uh, the rate of testing is still uh, a little bit unstable, and I touched on that on the previous slide, but it is definitely trending upwards, so that is good. We definitely want to see testing continuing to go up. Uh, the rate of new case presentation is definitely rapidly declining, and that's a very, very good thing. Uh, total hospitalization starting to decline, and then new deaths are just starting to decline as well. So looking at things from a national perspective, there definitely is a lot of good news to go over here. Now, in my opinion, something that I do wish the COVID tracking project would make widely available is to uh, provide graphs that track, 
uh, that track the percentage of new tests that come back uh, positive for COVID-19. So they do make uh, all of their data downloadable as Excel spreadsheets. So I went ahead and downloaded those data and then created a new column myself that should actually track the percentage of positive test cases. Uh, so this goes back to uh, early July. Uh, the data look really, really weird if you include uh, the entire last uh, 12 months or so. So I didn't do that. Uh, but dating back to early July, you can kind of see the overall trend here and you can actually see a little bit of what I'm talking about here in how bad this current wave that we have been in it, uh, has been. So you can see that as far as the percentage of tests that come back positive, during the worst part of this particular wave, we get up close to 16%, which is uh, abysmal in terms of uh, indicating how good a job we're doing preventing spread of the virus. So we've been doing pretty badly in that regard. But if you look, I, and I also generated a seven day moving average uh, trend line, just like what the COVID tracking project does. And you can hopefully see here that while there are a little blip, few blips here and there, uh, the trend line here is definitely trending towards the positive. So uh, we're just getting to the point where uh, on average over any given week, uh, the percentage of tests that come back positive is just finally dipped below 10% and we're actually uh, below 9% now. So we definitely want to see that continue to move in that direction. Okay, so since I live in Oklahoma and most of my uh, Facebook friends and Twitter followers and, the, and people of that nature are Oklahoma residents, I did want to go ahead and provide a little bit of update uh, specific to Oklahoma. The data look a little bit wonkier here, and there's actually a reason for that that I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, testing has fluctuated a little bit, but it has not really changed a whole lot. And if you ignore the uh, seven day moving average and you just look at the raw data behind it, there is a reason wh why you see so much fluctuation there. And this is one thing I kind of hate about the Oklahoma Department of Health. They have a policy where they do not report negative uh, tests uh, over the weekends or holidays. So every time you see a big gap right here, that indicates that we've hit a weekend. So uh, things are a little bit weird in how they get reported, uh, which is why the seven day moving average is so important because that should kind of nullify uh, the weirdness of those particular data. So you can kind of appreciate that testing is mostly staying the same in Oklahoma. Uh, new cases, you can kind of see overall we are starting to decline a little bit more. We're not quite at the same sort of inflection point uh, that uh, the national scene saw uh, about a week or two ago. So we're lagging a little bit behind the national scene, but we are still improving there. Uh, hospitalizations are starting to improve, uh, but deaths are still kind of on an upward climb. But if we uh, kind of have faith in the data showing trends that should uh, extrapolate out to uh, all 50 of the states, we should have at least some confidence that the death total should kind of start trending in the right direction here pretty soon as well. Uh, so I also track the percentage of positive tests in Oklahoma. And again, the data look really weird here because of that uh, Oklahoma Department of Health policy of not reporting out positive tests over weekends. So I actually had to remove some of those data points, otherwise the data would have looked even weirder than it already does. But if you look at the seven day moving average trend line here in purple, you can see that uh, here recently we are starting to get to what looks like a decline in the number of, in the percentage of positive cases here in Oklahoma. So uh, the last most uh, available uh, uh, percent positive uh, number that we see here is looks like maybe about 12 or 13 percent. So again, that's indicative of the idea that Oklahoma's lagging a little bit behind the national scene, but hopefully we should kind of start to catch up here pretty soon. Uh, so some takeaways there, Oklahoma does appear to be lagging behind uh, the national trend. Uh, but still overall, our current outbreak does appear to be getting better. Uh, I mentioned that the data seem to be confounded a little bit by that Department of Health policy of not reporting negative tests over the weekends. Hospitalizations and deaths are still a little bit of a problem here in Oklahoma. Hospitalizations do look like they're getting a little bit better, but deaths still are a big, big, big problem. So we definitely want to see those things get better soon. Uh, so. Just some last takeaways and some uh, look aheads to the future. 
uh, the current national decline that we're seeing in uh, the current wave of the pandemic, which I mentioned how good of news that that is. This is happening at a very fortuitous time because just over the last month, we have uh, seen uh, obviously a very welcome emergence of the COVID-19 vaccine, whether you're talking about the Moderna one or the Pfizer BioNTech one. Uh, the AstraZeneca one, and then Johnson & Johnson just recently came out with a vaccine that shows uh, promising efficacy against the virus. So uh, the decline in the outbreak that we're seeing right now is happening at a very good time because as this outbreak kind of starts to wane down a little bit, if we can get as many people as possible vaccinated, we can uh, either totally prevent the next outbreak, which that may be a little bit overly optimistic or, at, or maybe a little bit more reasonable of an outlook, we can definitely stunt the next outbreak so that it is not nearly as significant as this one. So uh, definitely a good time for the outbreak to start waning off. Uh, the next outbreak should not be definitely not be as severe due to a very significant percentage of the population that is currently inoculated. Uh, this current percentage, uh, I haven't looked at the most recent data, but I think we should be getting pretty close uh, to at least 20 million Americans vaccinated. So we should be getting pretty close to the uh, kind of 5 to 10 percent range there. Uh, so if we can maybe get that number up into maybe the 30s or the 40s in terms of percentage of Americans vaccinated, we should be able to uh, significantly head off the uh, next outbreak whenever that does occur. Uh, the major, major concern with the pandemic right now is the rapid emergence of co uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, mutated variants. Uh, so the virus does appear to be mutating quite rapidly. And this could definitely complicate some of the future projections and our ability to fight the virus because uh, these vaccinations that we have currently right now are based on the genetic sequence and the uh, uh, protein sequence of the virus a couple of months ago. So as mutations kind of pile up, the DNA sequence and the uh, protein sequence are kind of rapidly getting shifted around so that someone who is inoculated with the COVID-19 vaccine, they're generating antibodies against the protein that the virus made the virus several months ago. So if you ha get infected with a new virus that produces a protein that that antibody no longer recognizes, then that vaccinated person could theoretically get sick even though they are vaccinated. The good news is that all available ev evidence seems to suggest that the vaccines are still effective against some of these variants. But one thing that we do know is that the virus is rapidly mutating, so we definitely cannot eliminate the possibility that there's going to be some sort of uh, mutated variant in the future that finds a way to evade the vaccine. So uh, I have heard that uh, all of these uh, pharmaceutical companies like Moderna and like Pfizer are kind of standing at the ready to modify their vaccines based on what we see with some of these new mutated variants. So definitely the good news there is that uh, we should be ready to kind of quickly counteract some of those uh, mutations if uh, it gets to the point where they can kind of uh, circumvent the vaccine. Okay, so that does it for this update. I uh, want to thank you for watching, and uh, I'm going to hope to do this just about every Monday, hopefully until the pandemic is over. I definitely don't want this to be a, a terribly long-term project that I undergo. I don't want to be doing this uh, next January for sure. Uh, so I'll go ahead and sign off for now, and I will see you next Monday with a new update. So long.